It's about our really cool clock here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This is our moon countdown clock where we are counting down the next five years to 2024 when we're planning to send humans to the moon as part of the Artemis program. So this clock is counting down the days, hours, minutes and seconds to 2024 when the first woman and the next man will walk on the moon's south pole. So exactly. <laughs> Get excited for that. And if you want to learn more, you can go to nasa.gov slash Artemis. But for now, let's get into the topic of the day, right? Yeah. Can you guys start off by telling us how is NASA reimagining urban transportation? <laughs> yeah, so there's um, this new concept that's come about. It's called urban air mobility. So you might hear us call it UAM. Okay. So what is like UAM, yeah. right? So um, one can imagine above them an air, tra uh, air traffic management system that has everything from small delivery drones to passenger carrying air taxis flying safely and efficiently above um, urban centers or you know, almost above anywhere, mm -hmm. um, almost every day. And that's that vision that we're really trying to enable where we have new aircraft, new entrants, uh, making our lives easier yeah. by providing functions that we all really need. Okay, amazing. Yeah. So how did we get here? What, like, what led to this moment where we're working on this now? Yeah, so um, industry has really been pushing things forward. There's folks know, right, as um, air, we have automobiles, and as automobiles have been moving and developing, you have this new advent of electric yeah. electric cars, right? Right, right? So that same technology can now actually also be applied to aircraft. Wow, so we okay. have electric propulsion for aircraft. So just like um, you have this new clean and efficient way of uh, providing transport for vehicles, mm -hmm. this new clean electric transport can be applied for aircraft. Okay. So we have um, new automation also that's coming into play, so new control systems that are on board vehicles. And it's really that combination of those two things. Electric okay. propulsion technology plus automation has really led us towards this uh, new uh, kind of mode of transportation that we're really excited about. Okay, awesome, awesome. So these air taxis you've been describing, I think you came with an image of an example, yeah. a concept, yeah. right? Okay, let's Let's, let's bring that up and you can talk to us about what we're seeing. Sure. Oh, cool. So this is a concept uh, vehicle. This is what we call an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. You can see it has four rotors, two on each side. So what's a rotor? Um, a rotor yeah. are blades that spin to help generate lift, kind of like a helicopter. Okay. Right? So helicopter, you typically have one rotor um, above and then you have a tail rotor behind. And so what these rotors do is they provide lift. Um, this is just one configuration of a potential urban air mobility vehicle. There are many con different configurations. You can also see here that that vehicle also has a wing. Right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. how would these vehicles kind of fly? You can imagine that they would take off vertically and then shift to forward flight, leveraging their wing to have efficient oh. performance. Okay. A cross between a helicopter's takeoff yeah. and a plane flying forward. Yeah. Exactly. All right, yeah. sweet. We have a couple of questions here already. We have um, Big Bad Tom who says, don't we already have air taxis, but are known as a plane? <laughs> good yeah, question. That is a good question. Um, so traditional uh, commercial aircraft, current day uh, aircraft that we all fly in today, those are for longer flights typically, right? So mm -hmm. you might fly from San Francisco to LA or um, San Francisco to New York or wherever you are interested in flying. Um, those are over longer longer trips, mm -hmm. so you're covering lots of miles. Right. And also those aircraft use fuel, so jet mm -hmm. fuel. These new air taxis or urban air mobility vehicles are uh, electric propulsion vehicles, so you're no longer relying on jet fuel. Mm -hmm. And in addition, they're typically flying shorter missions. So there's a lot, there's a kind of a wide range of their mission types, but you're typically flying shorter missions and you're using a different mode of, of fuel. Right. And mm -hmm. in, inside of, within a city or a yeah. couple yeah. cities, something. And they're also smaller. City limits, yeah. Yeah. Smaller. Smaller. Or Normally, between cities, yeah. right? Yeah. So you would yeah. normally book a flight from San Jose to San Francisco. Right. Right. But right. this concept. So we all wish with the traffic. Yeah. And yeah. that's exactly what right. this is looking at. Yeah. Right, okay. right. Taking us off the road. Like, so Hovercat here says, will they be like large, multi-copter, battery powered? What kind of range are we talking about? Yeah, so there's a whole host of different configurations. Mm -hmm. Some have uh, four rotors like we saw in that image. Some have two. Some have many. Um, and they, can, they also have some with wing configurations. They typically are about four to eight passenger carrying in terms of the size. And many of them are electrically powered. So yes, battery power is, is where many of them are going. Mm -hmm. 
when we're talking about passengers, but actually cargo could be one of the first things yeah. that really starts to test this concept out. Okay, right? yeah. makes sense. Yeah, so passenger vehicles, cargo delivery. Are there other applications that you guys see as really important? Um, yeah, so one of the major applications we can see coming forward is uh, emergency services. Okay. So one yeah. can imagine if you have um, current day helicopters being used to provide ambulance support services, uh -huh. these yeah. vehicles could be flown in areas that might be dangerous or difficult to get to um, and provide those same emergency type services. So there's a whole host of applications. Awesome. Right. So that, that's easy to see Yeah. how we're going to use them, how it's going to be super helpful. Mm -hmm. There must be challenges for people like you to develop these systems. Are there a few that you would highlight? Yeah, um, so I would actually take a, a phrase that's used by the FAA. So that's the, the Federal Aviation Administration? Right, right. Okay. right. So we are uh, working very closely with them to see if we can make urban air mobility a reality. Mm -hmm. One of the phrases that they like to use is they like to focus on the aircraft, the airman or airwoman, and the airspace. So okay. what does that mean? Well, these vehicles, they're new. Right? So these aircraft have to be certified. Uh, there are going to be interesting challenges on how we, uh, how we certify these, these vehicles as they have different okay. performance characteristics. We mentioned that they're going to be yeah. battery powered or electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. That has implications on their certification. Okay. Certifying them as safe to fly, like exactly. they're brand new and we're going to declare them safe for the, for the skies in our cities. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then if we talk about the airman or the airwoman part, um, that imp or airperson, that implies that mm -hmm. we have to also think about what is the role of the pilot and how do they interface with potentially new controls, right? right? Mm -hmm. Like if they have okay. different whole ways of training. flying, whole new training, yeah. uh, potentially a pool of pilots that may not have the same training that our current pilots today have. Mm -hmm. So what, how do they actually fly these vehicles? That's also a really important question that we have. And then the last piece, which I think is also really important, is how do we integrate these vehicles in our airspace? Into their space. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not just one or two of these vehicles that may be flying in the future. You can imagine hundreds or thousands of them. And if that's the case, how do we integrate them safely and efficiently into our air transportation system, into our national airspace? Right. And an interesting part of the research, actually, if you look at those three buckets, right, the, the aircraft and the airman or a woman and the airspace, mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that are done in the airspace now for the current traffic may be better handled by one of those other buckets. Oh, okay. Some of the things that a, a pilot takes care of now maybe can be better handled by the airframe itself. So understanding these, where these things should get handled in this new way of travel is, is an important area of research as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We have a good question here from Space Walrus. He says, um, are we going to have air traffic lights? Is there mm. going to be a direct path they follow, mannerisms, things like that, that can mm, help yeah. with navigating? Yeah, this is actually the exciting part. Uh, Shimanjali talked earlier about the advances in vehicles that are, are allowing us to get to this point in time, but actually the advances in airspace management are mm -hmm. really important as well, and these two things are converging. So yeah, there actually will be stoplights. They'll be digital, right? <laughs> they won't actually right. be floating and hovering up there. <laughs> uh, but Red, yellow, green. <laughs> yeah, and there would be a set of procedures and, and policies and rules that people uh, that are operating in, this, in yeah. this airspace would need to follow in order to have the whole thing still work safely and efficiently. So uh, figuring all of that out is a bigger of research and we, we do collaborate with the FAA to figure out what is a good path forward. Yeah, yeah. And you said this is about helping these new vehicles get into the national airspace, right? Can, can you define for everybody what that really means? The national airspace system yeah. is, uh, it's, it's what enables us to have air traffic and air transport in the U.S. today. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of everything that makes that happen. So it's, it's the runways you can think of, the air traffic control towers, the airports, the radars. It's actually the vehicles as well and the people that uh, take care of all these things and actually run them day to day, but it's also things you can't touch. It's things like uh, rules and procedures and frequencies. All of that stuff together makes up the national airspace system. Okay. So how do you yeah. in introduce new things into that? You can see it's a delicate dance to make sure you right. don't harm what's working well now mm -hmm. and enable these new, yeah. new ways of travel. You guys are the choreographers of urban air mobility. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Is that your job title? <laughs> Can we change our job titles? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good I don't think this is a question on the list, but I'm sure that people are asking themselves, why does NASA work on this? Mm. You guys have a yeah. good answer for that? Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, but, go for sure. You know, the thing uh, people forget is that first day in NASA stands for aeronautics. And we do a lot of aeronautics research. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And even people that do remember that aeronautics is part of what we do, uh, they may 
forget that air traffic management is actually a major part of aeronautics, is how do you actually allow these vehicles to get up in the air and mm -hmm. fly around and do what they do. Right. Um, and we have a, a pretty good history here at NASA Ames and within NASA as a whole of doing that kind of research. Mm -hmm. So it's really natural that uh, this idea of this new airspace management concept uh, kind of originated with us. Yeah, and, and I would say we're, we're also been collaborating with the FAA for a number of years. So as our research has been developing, we've been collaborating with the FAA to transfer technologies and new research capabilities to really make our airspace much more efficient, our air traffic management really improve efficiencies as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you guys work closely. And I know that our aeronautics research goes way, way back here at Ames. We act at the center here, Ames Research Center, we started as an aeronautics lab, right? Mm -hmm. In 1939, mm -hmm. December 20th, oh. 1939, <laughs> wow. which makes tomorrow our birthday! Yay. Yay. Birthday, Ames. Happy birthday, Ames. It's our 80th anniversary tomorrow, so we're glad you could be here and help us yeah. celebrate. Yeah. So do you have any favorite fun facts about that air traffic management research that's so important that we do here? Yeah. Well, first of all, I was told there would be cake. So oh. That's the main Sorry, Sorry, Joey. Joey. Okay. Anyway. So yeah, we've, we've, we have done a lot of research in air traffic management, and you know, a lot of the tools are behind the scenes. They're things that people won't see every day. I bet, yeah. Uh, but they are the kind of things that save people uh, five minutes mm -hmm. here, ten minutes there on your way to somewhere, right? Everyone has landed at, at an airport and, and has kind of waited to get a gate, right? How do you optimize that and make people get to their gate faster? Right. Uh, how do you let people route around uh, bad weather quickly and efficiently and save five minutes uh, and a smoother ride to get to where you're going? And these are time savings for us as passengers, but that translates also to money savings for mm -hmm. the airlines, right? Mm -hmm. And these things add up five minutes here, 10 minutes there over the course of a year over across all the airlines. Right. Mm. These savings really add up. And these are the things that, a lot of the things that we've we've uh, originated research here at NASA Ames. Awesome, yeah. yeah. And I think um, some of these efficiencies have come from flying in the air. Some of them actually have come from trying to make the surface operations much more efficient. And so really like Joey was saying, it's it's all about time, right? That's yeah. our most valuable commodity. And so how do we how do we save our, our time? And that's where we develop algorithms, tools, work really closely with air traffic controllers to yeah. give them tools to make their jobs um, easier. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we've been doing research on fundamentally for the like, last 30 years. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's going back. Yeah. It's not just research. It's transferring it to the FAA yep. for oh, yeah. to make them real. Yep. Right, right, right. Yep. They actually yep. put it into use, right? Right. Yep. right. Yeah, awesome. So tools in our air traffic control towers, um, almost every air traffic control tower today has some technology that we have worked on in here at NASA. Mm, that's so awesome. Yeah. I don't think people know that. We have a, a question here from just me and my laptop. Uh, what part of the traffic or air traffic management do you see controlled autonomously? Hmm. I think uh, if if we think about how many of these operations there are going to be in the future, if people if people's minds you know race a little bit and you think about how how much how many new flights there will be, mm -hmm. the current system isn't set up to handle that many more flights that quickly. Uh, so actually, a lot of the functions to enable these new entrants are going to need to be automated, mm -hmm. um, as well as some of the processes on the existing side in order for them to know how to integrate and manage this new traffic as well. But we're not going to have enough controllers that can talk to all of these aircraft to do all of these things all the time like they right. do with yeah. the aircraft today. Yeah. So a lot of those functions are going to be automated, so there will be a lot of automation to enable this to happen. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. Do you want to take any more right now? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's there's plenty. The chat is really <laughs> blowing up. People are very interested in this topic. Um, there's some, some questions about, you know, how do we, so Hobbs555 uh, says, how do we prevent mid-air collisions with air traffic, yeah. or, uh, with air taxis? Excuse yeah, me. so like Joey was mentioning, there's going to be um, new automation that's going to come on board the vehicle potentially, as well as tools um, for air traffic management services. Mm -hmm. So what are the intersection of tools that are on board the vehicle, as well as services that might be provide, provided mm -hmm. um, from potentially air traffic controllers or other entities? And that's kind of what we're investigating. And then where does automation help ensure that we reduce um, any issues in terms of safety impacts? So safety is kind of the number one goal. Of How course, do you ensure yeah. safe operations? Yeah, uh, that's great. And the, the tools we develop, they, they really look at a few different layers, right, of, of how you make this happen. The air traffic management layer, that's usually a strategic look ahead. Like, how do we not put too many vehicles in one spot oh, such yeah. that it's really hard for them to avoid each other? Mm. Right, so the it's planning. strategically, you yeah. kind of keep them apart through this ground automation and, and having them share what they're going to do with each other. 
Um, but then more tactically, a lot of that onboard capability is going to be important to keep them separated. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So all these tools that you guys are talking about, a lot of that work is done at Ames here, but also in all other NASA centers across the country, right? Yeah. So you guys have a lot of partners. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, NASA Armstrong, um, NASA Langley, Glenn, almost all the NASA centers that are focused on aeronautics mm -hmm. are contributing to making urban air mobility a reality. Okay. So this is pretty exciting. Yeah. yeah. A big collaborative effort. Yeah. yeah. So when did, when did all this begin for urban air mobility and, and what's going on today? What yeah. Kind of work is happening now? So uh, one of the the areas where this kind of first started in terms of NASA involvement is what we call the Grand Challenge. Grand Challenge. Yeah, it sounds kind of exciting, Grand. right? <laughs> yeah. So the, the Grand Challenge is an activity um, in which we are working collaboratively with the FAA as well as industry partners, both vehicle industry partners and airspace industry partners, okay. to kind of develop an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So we can really begin testing out some of these concepts. What does it mean to fly a vehicle? What kind of data do we need to collect to help with the right. certification process, understand the performance of these vehicles? And then also start understanding what does it mean, what kind of tools and technologies, what kind of software do we need to build mm -hmm. to actually have some sort of air traffic management system for these vehicles as, as many of them start coming up and uh, becoming a reality. Yeah. So the grand challenge is a series of flight demonstrations and simulation activities where, where we really hope to explore all the safety cases um, as mm -hmm. well as collect data to help us move the industry forward. Yeah, makes sense. You get as many minds as possible thinking right. about it predicting what you have to work out now right. and doing the work, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's definitely a very collaborative effort. Awesome. <laughs> Great. A legit Twitch channel uh, asks, will there be miniature airports for places to pick up and drop off? That'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> so some of the concepts that are coming up in terms of infrastructure, which is actually a really important concept, mm -hmm. uh, is a concept of vertiports or vertipads or skyport skypads, however you wish to call it. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of imagine like a helicopter pad, right? Yeah, okay. These mm -hmm. could be on the ground or on, on actually the, uh, the top of a building, right? Yeah, and yeah. so these could be locations where these aircraft could take off. Because remember, they can take off vertically and right. land vertically. So right. they don't need a like runway. A yeah. Yes. They don't need yeah. a runway like a normal aircraft today. Mm -hmm. So that is what's going to allow operations in an urban center, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Is this yeah. going to mean the end of traditional flight, <laughs> or is this really just complementary to everything we use today? Yeah, it's, it's definitely not an end to, to yeah. um, current day aviation. Okay. In fact, you can think of it as a complement to help mm -hmm. you actually use current day aviation even more, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one can imagine that you might want to get from wherever you're located, a suburb, to your nearest airport. And normally we would have to mm -hmm. sit in traffic, drive maybe half an hour, 40 minutes to get there. Who knows, yeah. <laughs> so depending on where you're located. Yeah, but yeah. now what if you can take one of these air taxis or air shuttles mm -hmm. to get to your airport? Yeah. Now it's actually much easier to use a tr uh, commercial aviation like we do today. So these are just another uh, form of transportation to help us use current day aviation. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. And about air taxis or air shuttles, yeah. which you just kind of made a distinction there. Um, do you think that these are going to be taxis that I, I call up and I say, I personally want to go to my specific friend's house? Or, or is it going to be like a, a subway or a city bus that has a route? Mm -hmm. So most likely, as this uh, industry develops, initially it will probably more, be more like an air shuttle or an air metro, where you have a series of designated locations where you have pickups and drop-offs and um, at, at scheduled times. Okay, mm -hmm. that's mostly to help us understand what are the what's the feasibility in the of, beginning, of this, yeah, yeah, of this type of transportation. Yeah, but on-demand air mobility is something that uh, industry, as well as uh, we, are researching and investigating of how to enable mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So we're actually looking at both: how mm -hmm. do we have a air metro or air shuttle, as well as on-demand and urban air mobility. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. yeah cool. <laughs> Uh, we have a question here from again from uh, Space Walrus. What elevation will they be flying at? What if you're you're in the city? Do we weave through skyscrapers? <laughs> yeah, good question. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> what so should we picture here. <laughs> so since these vehicles have uh, kind of a wide range of configurations, they mm -hmm. have different cruising altitudes that they would fly at. You can expect though a range of typically from somewhere to like a thousand to four thousand feet is on average that typical range of these of these vehicles of the urban air mobility vehicles that are 
a little mm-hmm. bit larger than mm-hmm. remember um, than some of the drones that have been flying below 400 feet. Mm-hmm. And then they are also kind of smaller than your traditional aircraft because they only have about four to eight passengers typically. Okay. So that's the altitude they would be flying at. Yeah. In terms of weaving between skyscrapers, <laughs> uh, I think we're looking at procedures as well as uh, ways for these aircraft to fly safely. Um, and that includes safety of the passengers on board as well as the safety of the people on the ground. Right, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see yeah. a question here for the, for the both of you. Seriously Gaming asks, what are Shivanjali and Joey's thoughts on noise pollution from these? And what are their thoughts on potential objects falling to Earth? Yeah. Is that a part of it? Uh, definitely want to avoid the objects falling to Earth. Uh, yeah. And in general, noise pollution speaks to a larger issue of kind of public acceptance of these kind of operations. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we can solve a lot of technological problems and make sure things stay safe and efficient in the airspace. But if the public's not ready to accept these kind of operations for whatever reason, whether it's environmental, including noise, or, or something else, um, then this won't ever take off, so to speak, right? So part of the research when we do our testing is actually making sure we're starting to ask some of those questions and collect some initial data on on public acceptance so that we can feed some of those conversations to see what kind of barriers might be there uh, to kind of that public acceptance question. So uh, noise is an issue, and I think you'll see a lot of the manufacturers of these vehicles, designers of these vehicles, and of the airspace procedures are kind of cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. They want to be aware of trying to minimize the impact or acceptability of, of these operations. So it is something that is considered in the design of all the pieces of the system. Right, right. Good to hear. Yeah. 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 Uh, what's another question we have here? Uh, Hobbies 555, would there be weather restrictions on air taxis? Yeah, so um, just like today in commercial aviation today, weather plays a big role in how, mm-hmm. how aviation, you know, of um, goes on today. Right. And similarly, it will play a role for these new vehicles, for these urban air mobility vehicles. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to understand is when we p- perform tests as part of the Grand Challenges, understand what is your performance? When can you fly? At mm-hmm. what uh, gusts of winds are oh, there yeah. limitations on your performance? Mm-hmm. And those are some of the things that we're really trying to investigate so we can answer that question in a better fashion once we have data on how these vehicles actually perform under different um, wind under different wind, wind levels as well mm-hmm. as different types of precipitation. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, really yeah. specific stuff. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're not you're leaving researching anything to chance. And testing for. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Really interesting. Kind of related to that is you know understanding the performance of the vehicle so that it knows what it can handle, mm-hmm. what situations it can handle. But then actually on the weather side, actually doing the research to make sure that that information is available to those operators. Okay. Because right. the weather we use today for aviation is really focused around airports and the in route environment, okay, and uh, yeah. you know there's some specialized stuff for helicopters in cities, but that all needs to scale up quite a bit in order to provide the right information to operators so that they can fly safely, right. given the performance characteristics of their vehicle. Yeah. So a lot of cities aren't outfitted for that level of granularity of weather. Oh, right? okay. So how do you get those weather services and weather requirements developed so that you can actually enable these operations safely? So that's a, uh, a larger of research mm-hmm. that we poke into, and we also try and encourage uh, industry and universities and, and other folks to, to come along with us in that research. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of along those lines, the weather is actually very interesting in mm-hmm. an urban center, I right? Was so, ask. Yeah. yeah. So as you have wind flow between buildings, mm-hmm. as you have um, kind of different types of eddies kind of put round off of building to building surfaces, you have interesting effects that okay. can occur. And so yeah. that's really important for us mm-hmm. to, to have some knowledge about and mm-hmm. understand, such that we can have safe safe. Mm-hmm performance of these vehicles. Yeah. So that's actually a really big part what Joey was referring to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can imagine. I felt that in cities, right? Yeah, of course. Walking between two skyscrapers yeah. and yeah. the wind is just like yeah. gusting yeah. by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So good to know you're thinking about it. <laughs> oh, let's see what other questions we got. Will we one day see a return of airships or zeppelins? Ghost of ET asks. Who knows? Yeah, so I, you know, airships, the dirigibles have been have been around for quite some time and have been used, um, you know, obviously in the past. And now we see the Goodyear blimp once in a while, Actually, right? Yeah, so <laughs> recently. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you know, airships do have some some purpose and do off, are used for some some uh, use cases. But how they're going to be integrated in the airspace? It's a similar question, just like a lot of these new entrants. How do how, what's your performance like? What's your performance characteristics? Based on that, how yeah. do we integrate you safely into our airspace? Right. So those same types of questions. Okay. Supply, regardless of what what type of vehicle you may be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the vehicles you guys are talking about are much more smaller, four well, to eight passengers. Smaller and a little bit faster, right? Bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not drifting along yeah. to your little destination. Yeah, just a tad. <laughs> um, a Trek Petro One. Do you have any idea how much energy it takes to vertically lift 
the passengers? He gave a number of eight passengers, but just in general. Yeah, so mm-hmm. typically what you what is desired is you want to um, have vertical lift up above 50 feet okay. um, such that you are climbing at a rate of about 100 feet per minute. <laughs> so the energy that's required obviously depends on the weight of that individual airframe mm-hmm. plus the number of passengers or cargo that you might have on board. So I would say it actually does vary depending on your configuration of your vehicle. Mm-hmm. But what is neat is the fact that there's been quite a bit of development in distributed electrical propulsion, uh-huh. which means you can use these um, electrically powered rotors, have them distributed across the airframe such that it's actually much easier to, to provide lift, lift for, oh. for aircraft. Craft. And like that's that's a new technology. Like we yeah. saw in that in that vehicle yeah, concept, exactly. right? It had the rotors along the wings. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. I see. Right. Cool. And the airframe, when you guys say that, that means it's like the structure of the aircraft? Correct. Okay. Just, just how that aircraft is configured. Does it have two rotors, four rotors? Does it have a wing? I see. What, is, what does it look like? Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Okay, cool. We probably have time for a few more questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a question here from Dact the Werewolf. Uh, what power densities would be required to make long-range, high-capacity flight possible using battery power. Mm. Yeah, power is a big issue, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. So the manner in which uh, battery technology is developing is, is something that industry is really moving forward with. Mm-hmm. Things that they're concerned about is their charge and discharge mm-hmm. rates, how mm-hmm. qui- and then also how quickly can you recharge your, your actual battery on board so that you can fly another mission or go on another trip, right? And so there is um, quite a range of energy density that's required, again, depending on your configuration right. and depending on your mission profile. Right. Am I flying 50 miles or am I flying 40 miles, right. right? So depending on the mission you wish to achieve, you do see a kind of a range in terms of the battery or power requirements for that vehicle. Mm-hmm. And just uh, yeah. bring it back to the question of the vertiports, kind of designing the system and the power requirements, you know, you you may want your vertiports close to right. a substation that can supply the right amount of power to recharge you quickly. Right. Uh, so all of these things are definitely interrelated, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you sort of touched on this already, but maybe to sum it up for Fergus Diggums, can you comment about the possible infrastructure that might be needed for the shorter range trips? Will it use existing airports or a combination of existing and new? And you talk about rooftops, but like, how would you yeah. sum that up? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, I, I think that if we're talking about a, a new mode of transportation with new use cases, there's probably going to be new infrastructure needed, and that's when we talk about these vertiports and and charging stations and and all of these these things that don't exist, as well as things like surveillance, as well as weather monitoring. We talked about earlier surveillance, like keeping an eye on on the uh, vehicles, surveillance, or? like uh, knowing where the vehicles are. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Not so much. Uh, how they get used, but yeah, just where the vehicles are. Right okay. now, you know, we have radars and they can see all the big airplanes in the yeah, sky. Just keep track um, of them all. That infrastructure doesn't necessarily let us have full visibility into the area where these things might be flying. So surveillance as well as, again, uh, the recharging and the landing mm-hmm, and the mm-hmm. takeoffs, all of that's infrastructure that definitely has to be considered when designing yeah. the system. And yeah. I would say infrastructure is actually a big big part of this, right? Of course. And the mm-hmm. FAA is, uh, as well as NASA and as well as industry and other research institutions, they are looking to do understand what are the infrastructure requirements. Requirements. Mm-hmm. And there are sensor requirements, but then also things such as lighting requirements, right? Mm-hmm. What, what kind of procedures are need to be developed for the, that type of infrastructure? Um, so there's a whole host of information that would come along with the infrastructure that we need that will be needed for these vehicles to land or take off from locations near us, right? right. So there's there's lots right. of interesting research there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Re- research kind of leads the way to those answers. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Discovers the questions and then yeah. leads us to the answers. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, maybe just one more. And this question came in a while ago from Hobbs five five five, so maybe it's been answered. But I want to know: Is this like flying cars? What's the <laughs> question? Can we call these flying cars, or is that something else? Well, so if you. If you want to call them flying cars, um, <laughs> you technically can. I mean, some of these vehicle configurations do have uh, wheels, right, oh, okay. for landing. Cool. Some do, some don't, right? Mm-hmm. So d- if you have wheels, then you can actually do taxiing, I guess, technically, if you can yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. call the flying car. Yeah. Um, you know, people do call them urban air mobility vehicles due to the fact they can perform a number of different functions and have slightly different operations than what we are used to today, right? Yeah, so yeah. The, the terms you use can change, but yeah. essentially it's like an air taxi, a flying car, 
kind of whatever you wish to call it. Yeah, and yeah. I think that the car implies a lot of freedom, right? And that's that on-demand okay, mobility yeah. we were mentioning earlier. Yeah. Um, so most of these initial vehicles are probably more like the Air Metro, mm -hmm. which Shivangeli was mentioning mm -hmm, earlier, mm -hmm. right? They're kind of designated where they're going to go. Yeah. So if you wanted to call that a car, sure you could. Yeah. But in general, it's more like a, a subway or a, yeah. You know, it's it's going where it's going to go, and okay. it, it can help you get there quickly to start mm -hmm. us off. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. All right, well, let's move on to our next topic so that we don't run out of time, but we're going to come back to more questions later. So I know that NASA has already done a bunch of research over several years that really helped lay the groundwork for this urban air mobility work that you're doing. So, Joey, you were a big part of that. Can you tell us about the system you worked on? Yeah, so uh, for the past five years or so, we have been working on uh, how do you manage small drones at low altitude at kind of a big scale. How, how do you have thousands of small drones flying over the state of California taking care of things? Okay, yeah. Uh, so, again, that's the current air traffic management system was not designed to handle that kind of traffic. So, mm -hmm. how do we enable those use cases and those business cases to occur without overloading the current system and keeping everything as safe as possible? Mm -hmm. So, that's what came about. Uh, our research was called UTM, UAS Traffic Management. And again, UAS Traffic Management just means how do you manage drones? Right? How do you manage drones? Yeah. Okay. So the the drone the UAS is the drone. That's it is. right. That's yeah. Right. UAS. Is we a, love acronyms here. I know. I know. <laughs> so that's everyone's favorite acronym <laughs> within an acronym. It is. Yeah. Yeah. We get bonus points for compounding. You them. do. Yeah. Well done. Right. Uh, but yeah, we were focused again on small drones. We're talking about fifty-five pounds and under. Okay. And we're talking about low altitude, typically four hundred feet and under. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's you can hard. accomplish a lot of things just in that airspace with these kind of vehicles. Mm. Uh, and it made us ask certain questions and develop certain systems and test certain things with partners and the. FAA that lays the groundwork for some of the still open questions for urban air mobility that we have been talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, yeah, that sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah. kind yeah. of work you're doing. Um, you mentioned lots of applications. What are some examples for small drones? Uh, there there are a lot. Um, usually the, the, you can actually classify them into some of the more interesting ones into the three Ds, uh, dirty, dangerous, and dull jobs. Okay. There's a lot of jobs you can do with these drones that can actually keep people safer that are doing them, right? Uh, infrastructure inspection, for example, you know, looking at a cell tower, taking pictures, and making sure it's working correctly. Um, people die climbing those towers every year, yeah. right? And, and other kind of power line inspection. These jobs aren't always the safest jobs, but mm -hmm. you can make them safer by using drones, okay, right? Okay, perfect um, And then things like there's agricultural applications as well, taking pictures of your field and doing analysis on that, mm -hmm. as well as public safety things. Fire and police agencies are using these a lot more uh, mm -hmm. at a local level. Mm -hmm. um, large companies are talking about delivering things to your doorstep. Again, all this can happen with drones under 55 pounds mm -hmm. and under 400 feet. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things you can actually do with them. Right, yeah, yeah. for sure. And mm -hmm. how do you let everyone do all those things simultaneously and keep the airspace safe. Exactly. That was kind of the research that we were looking at. Yes, because mm -hmm. that's always the key, right? Yeah. yeah. Safety first. Safely, yeah. <laughs> what was your role exactly? Uh, so I was the chief engineer for the project, so it was really about kind of coordinating a lot of the technical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, I did focus a lot on the software aspect of it. So we talked about automation earlier and the airspace management, how it's going to have to be automated in the future to handle all of this traffic. Yeah. So how do you build a system that enables all this stuff to happen? You know, it's, right. it's, it's cloud-based and it, it leverages a lot of best practices in the software industry um, with our knowledge and expertise at NASA for air traffic management. Right? Right. So how do you marry those two things? Mm -hmm. And that's really uh, what, what we were looking at. And, and Joey won't admit this, but he was the brains behind the, the UTM project. And I would say that Joey and his team most recently won the NASA Software of the Year Award. So that's oh, actually yeah. kind of a big deal. Uh, so we give you. Joey a shout out for that. Thank you. Yeah, we, we have a lot of brains on the project, which is great, right? Yes. That's how you make it successful. You need a lot um, of perspectives. Yeah. Having a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds to come to that is how you kind of get to these innovative solutions. And NASA is a great place to kind of allow that to happen. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Congrats. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so. What are some specific uh, abilities you you gave the drones or the system? Um, like you want to keep them keep them separate, right? Oh, what yeah. are some specific so, examples? You know, we had sort of a clean sheet to begin thinking about how to get this done. Yeah, really. Again, it's a clean sheet with, with the understanding of how the airspace works and yes. how the vehicles work, right? So with those bounds, what what do we want the system to do? Mm. One of the key things is how do we help make sure the drones don't run into each other? Right. right? right. Yeah, so, for starters. Can we, can we build a yeah. system that helps them stay <laughs> safely separated? You know, yeah. to some degree. Um, also, how do we keep them separate from traditional aviation? How do we make sure they don't fly into other aircraft, right? Yeah. Can you build some system that helps helps with that process? You know, One layer of this isn't going to be the end all and be all of all these answers, but how do we start this process of keeping the airspace safe? Mm -hmm. um, also, how do we allow 
folks that are doing these operations and the vehicles that are doing these operations be identifiable, right? We don't want just rogue or unidentified mm. objects flying around the airspace. I People see. need to know what's there right. um, to keep the airspace, again, safe. There's kind of yeah. a security aspect to that as well. Um, and then how do you have some priority for important operations, right? So, okay. for example, uh, recently there was actually a drone that delivered a human kidney Oh, a no for transplant that was actually transplanted into a person wow. successfully, right? Oh. Um, so that was demonstrated one one important use case for drones. Oh yeah. How do we let that happen without being hindered by drones that are delivering hot dogs to people? Right. We want to make sure the hot dog drones get out of the way, right, and let the right. ki kidney drone come through. Right. right. <laughs> so that's just one example. How do you, here. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. So these these priority operations need to be thought of as right. important in the system as we design it out. Yeah. And there's a lot more sense. of the important class of operations you can you can you can think about, but the idea is how do we make sure that mm -hmm. that can actually occur? Right. That yeah. all of this can occur, right? You'll exactly. get your hot dogs. You'll get it. <laughs> but yeah. after the kidney gets right. delivered. 30 seconds later. Just, <laughs> right. Yeah. right. And, and I would actually add that services that Joey just laid out, they are extensible and applicable for any new entrant, right? So Joey was talking about how they were applied for uh, drones. But yeah. If you can think about for these larger urban air, air mobility vehicles, for any new entrant, your mm -hmm. Zeppelin, these same tenants can be applied. So it's actually a really great foundation for us to build off of and extend for new entrants into our national airspace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so, so clear how it right. supports the same things Shivanjali is working right. on and right. trying and, to make and happen. The, the, the key thing is, you know, the current system, again, air traffic controllers don't want to be controlling a 40 pound drone at 200 feet, right? They, they're not, yeah. they have enough to do with the, right. the big aircraft right, 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 and right. they don't want to hire 10,000 more operators uh -huh. to, to watch, <laughs> you know, all of these drones. Every single drone. Yeah, so again, kind of, this is the automation of the airspace and allowing these new entrants. And again, a lot of these things will translate over to uh, this this air taxi, urban air yeah. mobility world. Yeah. Uh, finding out how much of that transfers over, how much of it has to change a little bit. Um, but we have a foundation to start with. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of answers uh, Jenny CZ 25's question here. Management will be autonomous, and yes, it will be autonomous. It will have aut autonomous aspects, aspects. right? It okay. doesn't mean you just push a button and the airspace is completely uh, right. free to go. Mm -hmm. um, and the autonomous, the the autonomous nature of it will increase over time, mm -hmm. right? You know, when you get started, you only have so many operations, and you might have a, a good amount of human supervision. But then, as things scale out, how much of that can be automated and making sure you do it again in a safe way? Yeah, yeah it's more of like yeah. a continuum, right? So mm -hmm. it's uh, there's going to be pieces of it that are automated, some functions, and then how does that con how does that continuum grow? Grow as we right, move over forward time. time. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Building upon it. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. So, uh, the drone traffic management system, what does it look like or feel like for a user, a pilot? Like, if I want to fly my drone, what am yeah, I going right. to see? Yeah, in the future, hopefully, it would be very transparent. It shouldn't be a, a big burden to actually use the system. Um, so there's actually be a layer between you and the airspace, and it would be kind of a service provider to get into the airspace, almost like a cell service provider, right? Okay. If you want to make phone calls, you have a cell service provider, and yeah. you can talk to other cell service providers cleanly. Um, so you would have one of those providers that gets you access to the airspace, right? You would tell them what you want to do, maybe your intent, I want to fly from here to here, and I want to do it about this time. Mm -hmm. The idea is that these service providers share that information amongst each other, they do what's necessary to keep the airspace safe and deconflicted and, and messages flowing that need to flow. And you, as a, a pilot, just take care of your mission, okay. right? You just fly your mm -hmm. operation. How much of that operation is automated and not automated, you know, that depends in mm -hmm. the future how far you go. Mm -hmm. uh, but a pilot would be in charge of that operation and would do it cleanly and receive information back from these service providers about any changes in the airspace or things okay. you need to know. Right. Like, there's a storm coming up exactly. or there's an emergency operation. Or That's right. Yeah. That kidney's coming through. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, and add I, something? I, no, I was just going to add that I think um, there's the, the, the whole host of different types of operations. Um, yeah, it kind of lends itself to setting up different missions, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'd also add that the tools and the technologies and the integration with the partners uh, that was built up under UTM, I think, is a great model. Mm -hmm. They interface with a whole host of uh, industry partners along with the FAA, and that same model of collaborative innovation is what we're aiming for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. And uh, I wanted to go back to earlier, you, uh, somebody asked about um, like traffic lights or something. I forget what the question oh, yeah. was. Yeah. We were saying there would be digital traffic lights. Right. 
not physical things up in the sky. But you've told me that we can think of the drone traffic management as like rules of the road that we right. know when driving, right? Yeah. Can you talk about that. Uh, you know, we, we think about driving today. The folks that are driving in general, you hope and expect that they know the rules of the road, right? They know yeah. what a red light means. Right. They know what to do when you both come to a stop sign at the same time. They know how fast you can go on the freeway and how to change lanes. Those kind of things don't exist for drone traffic, right? So how do, what are those procedures? What are those rules? Who has the right of way in certain scenarios and how do you share that information to make sure that everyone's aware of the same rule set and, and those right. sorts of things so that is a lot of the research we do as well so that's really the drone traffic management system it's you know defining those rules of the roads the procedures right. uh, making sure everyone's checked out on all those things to yeah. enable all these operations to happen yeah yeah, yeah. that's a good yeah. and you know when you and you have on your phone it tells you when there's a traffic jam ahead right yeah. so that's the next level of services right and mm, that would right. be part of the ecosystem as well oh there is weather ahead or yes. there is a, a a lot of drones over here, mm -hmm. so maybe you should go mm -hmm. over there, yeah. right? Sharing data so that you can make those decisions. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah that's really clear. Cool. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Chindane. Uh, will these drones have an option for multitasking? For example, the drone could be delivering a kidney and also acting as a traffic camera en route. So will they have like different? I, yeah, I think the person waiting for the kidney would hope maybe that it's, <laughs> it's focused on the kidney right? <laughs> and not <laughs> right. doing that. <laughs> but in general, yeah, it's all about the vehicle yeah. capabilities. Right. What, what did they design the vehicle to do? Mm -hmm. And the idea with our research with traffic management and 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 all those sorts of things, how do we make sure we don't cut off any of those use cases? How mm -hmm. do we make sure we enable folks to do the things they need and want to do in the airspace safely? Um, so yes, uh, and we have looked at drones being repurposed. En route, in route, right? Mm -hmm. You may be doing regular traffic surveillance, but then maybe there's a search and rescue thing that has to happen, and that drone could be repurposed in flight and, and take off and do something. So this idea of repurposing is definitely out there. Yeah, cool. and I would say yeah. for whether it's single task or repurposing or multitasks, you know, what you need is a secure communication navigation platform, right? So you have to be able to communicate to that that vehicle, that drone, or that UAM, and be able to have that communication be secure. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, um, as you have multiple tasks, that still is the foundation is how do you have safe and efficient operations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Uh, so this year, you guys actually had a big milestone year, right? Yeah. Tell us about what went down. Right. I mean, we've been doing this since uh, 2014, you know, uh, researching this drone traffic management system. And we've been kind of building up in complexity of the kind of cases that you can handle. Mm -hmm. So when we got to this summer, uh, we actually executed a, uh, a flight test to demonstrate the most mature version of the system we have, and we did that in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. So we flew in yeah. downtown Reno, and we flew in Corpus Christi, Texas, right. uh, with the help of the FAA test sites at those areas, um, and many, many partners doing that with us, right, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and showing how the system would work in an urban environment, and finding out where the limits are, where the gaps are, and where it works really well. Uh, that's what we did this summer, and that was yeah. a, a really exciting time for that's us. That's awesome. Yeah. You guys got yeah. video of that, didn't you? Oh, yeah, we probably have some. Can you tell us about it if we can bring it? Sure. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're looking at Reno here. Uh, you're looking at a couple of drones uh, taken off from the top of a building, and you can see they're flying near the casinos, and they're coming really close to each other. There's actually more space than you can tell from the ground here. <laughs> and the key thing is that the two pilots for those vehicles know what the other one is doing because they've been sharing information. You can see one holding up here while another one passes by. Again, that's the rules of the road stuff we were talking about. Right. Um, so testing all those concepts, and here you're seeing kind of a, a mission control center with folks from NASA as well as the Nevada test site mm -hmm. uh, working to, together to execute these these activities sweet interesting so you were not the only one there were you joey you guys you yeah. both of you yeah I, I had the chance to go out and observe the utm uh, tests both in reno and, and texas and i would say seeing the drones flying in that urban environment yeah. um, really makes it tangible right, right this I is bet. a reality that's coming fairly soon and mm -hmm. to see how it's a combination of software um, they, they leverage cloud services plus the drone technology plus the interplay of the folks on the ground you really see what joey was referring to as earlier as kind of the national airspace mm -hmm. Kind of in a miniature version, yeah. running in these field trials, which is great to see, and it um, really lends itself to help us understand what are still some of the major questions that we have to address. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. all the data that's collected from these uh, demonstrations is really, I think, very valuable. Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah. What was your experience like, Tiffany? 
Well, so I seem to remember. I'm not an engineer or anything like that. So I, I was going to cover and help them amplify, you know, the research that they're doing for the public. But I mean, I would say Reno was cold, and then Texas was very, very hot. <laughs> um, but I would say, you know, it was really a great experience to see the team kind of just. I feel like every test day was different. Mm -hmm. um, they learned something one day and they applied it the next day. And even when there were cha challenges, to see them all kind of come together, fix, come up with a plan, fix it the next day was was really great to see and to have covered this project for like I don't know three four years now is kind yeah. of like great to see you know see this, it come together. Yeah, this accomplishment with yeah. them. It's it was really cool, really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what would you say you learned in the end from these tests in downtown yeah. Reno? And uh, I mean, it, it sounds kind of silly to say out loud, but it is really important to know that we learned that the system works. It works, yes. right? You can <laughs> yeah. actually you can actually do the things we thought it should be able to do, right? It helps drones stay separate. Again, it's not the mm -hmm. only layer of doing that, right. but it's a key layer of doing that. Um, you can make sure you have access for priority operations. You can actually identify the drones in the airspace digitally and, mm -hmm. and in other ways. Um, so all of those pieces were executed in that in that airspace. And the other key thing is finding out more about what it takes to fly in that environment, right? Like okay, what kind right. of what kind of things makes this hard, right? Ah, Let's yeah. go there and fly that. And mm -hmm. it's not again, it's not just flying one drone, mm -hmm. right? A lot of folks can demonstrate something with with one drone. And a lot of folks have done that with a lot of use cases. But bringing a, a full system out with many stakeholders trying to collaboratively manage this airspace yeah. and execute missions is really important to do and finding out where, where more work needs to be done and where things look like they're solved, right? And that's right. what these flight tests do for us. Right, perfect. Yeah. And so what's next for the drone traffic management project? Uh, so a lot of this, you know, we've been continually handing off to the FAA. We talk about a partnership, there, but it really is a tight partnership. We, yeah, it sounds We like meet it. with them often, uh, mm -hmm. probably more often than they would like, right? <laughs> uh, we're, we're talking with, with them quite often to make sure we understand what the FAA is thinking about where this is going, to make sure that what we're re our research is tracking with that, and maybe leading it a little bit if we can. Mm -hmm. um, but they're going to be executing a, a pilot program as well, a, a second part of a previous pilot program. And we want to help them in that execution. And really, that's about taking the technologies that we've been developing with the FAA and our, our industry partners and making them real in the airspace. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an important step in that direction. All so right. we're going we're gonna to keep going that way. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Resonator Games. Uh, is there any fundamental concept that those in the private or commercial um, sector testing of the drone should be paying attention to? There are so many pieces to this, right? Yeah. So a lot of folks uh, are specialized in a certain area, might be on the mm -hmm. platform itself, building, you know, a, a detect and avoid sensor. How do you actually see things in the airspace and get out of their way? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that continuing to push all of those lanes is important. I think understanding the ecosystem as a whole is also really important. I think folks that uh, do work on uh, important sensors and it's important platforms, it's important for them to also understand the ecosystem in which those drones will operate. So just trying to keep pace and understand where the research is heading and where the FAA has signaled things are going. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to stay abreast of all that stuff is really important. Mm, makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, Here's a comment on the drone traffic management system. Maybe you can respond. Twisted Metals asks, uh, the pilot will be watching a movie just like now 95% of the time. So a drone pilot will be watching on screen? Will they? I don't know. I would love to watch movies 95% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Or 95% of drone pilots, I understand. OK. Are they watching their flight on screen? Oh, I see. Are they physically watching the aircraft, or are they watching some representation of their operation on a screen? I guess that's the question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, think it's so. more the latter, right? Again, because we're, we're trying to build a system so that these vehicles can go beyond visual line of sight of the operator, the pilot. Oh, yes, of course. Right? right. So they're not going to be able to just watch, watch the drone. Watch it in the sky, right? Now, right. right? Um, and that's how you enable all these business cases. You can't have someone watching the drone if you're going to go deliver that thing, yeah. you know, uh, five away. miles away. Right. You know, you can't have someone or a line of someone's watching that. So how do you build a system that allows that? So yeah, there would be some representation of the operation occurring that the person that's in charge of that operation would have access to. Yeah. It might be as simple as a moving map with some alerts that are coming onto it, right? Something like you'd see on your, you know, uh, uh, for, for your regular driving, right? Something that's letting you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Or it could be more advanced, right? It could be a 3D view. It could be a first-person view. It really depends on the mission and the environment you're flying in and what the future rules actually are to do that. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. guess yes, 
I don't, I'm not, yeah. Yeah, I would add, regardless of whether it's a drone pilot or a pilot on board one of these new types of vehicles, there's going to be different ways of interacting with the vehicle and controlling the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Just as automation increases and um, there's changes in how those vehicles fly, I think there's going to be some changes in that traditional pilot flight deck or cockpit relationship. Yes. And how you interface with that is, is going to change, and that's also another interesting area of research. Um, all the way from, you know, human-computer interface logic that goes mm -hmm. behind that as mm -hmm. well as what button do I push to, right. to land or take <laughs> off or is there an easy fly button, right? So there's okay. all kinds of new ways to engage with with uh, aircraft, whether it's a drone mm -hmm. or some of these new vehicles. And right. I think that's a really interesting area. Yeah. I think one of the key things we're seeing a lot of research on from industry as well as, you know, the NASA side is how do these pilots maybe control more than one of these, right? Does it have to be a one-to-one -one relationship between one pilot and one active operation? Yeah. Or can you That's expand that further, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you actually have three people controlling eight vehicles? Or okay. can it be one controlling two? Like, what are the limits of that? And what tools need right. to exist in order to make sure that, again, happens very safely? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, we have a more. question here from uh, Tamo101. Is there any corp corporation uh, with autonomous car research, I expect there would be similar challenges and opportunities for with communication and control. So I think the same um, principles of, of autonomous car, mm -hmm. uh, autonomous vehicle, self-driving cars, however you wish to call it, mm -hmm. those, some of those same principles are, I think, important in, in aviation as well. So um, what can I understand what my environment is presenting to me, right? So do I have uh, some awareness of what my environment is? For airplanes, that would involve, or aircraft and drones, it would involve weather, mm -hmm. right? Um, knowing uh, how strong your communication signal is to your base operations. There all of those same types of, of questions about communication, safe communication, reliable communication, um, understanding of the environment around you, being able to react appropriately to the environment around you, knowing the rules of the road that Joey kind of referenced, whether mm -hmm. you're actually on the road or flying uh, flying in the air. Those are all the same principles yeah, that can be similar. applied. Yeah, yeah. yeah it makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, I want to jump back to another topic that I want to make sure we don't miss. Of course. One of the coolest things I recently learned about the urban air mobility research is the simulation work that you guys do. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think for all our Twitch fans out there, you guys might have uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator have, have used that. So just like you could um, emulate flying a, a Cessna or a Piper or even like a, a 747, we have uh, advanced flight simulators here at Ames. They Very are cool. kind of a combination of flight simulators. Some mm -hmm. are fixed, meaning they don't move, and some move and actually allow you to see all, feel all the forces that you would experience like you were flying in, in real life. Amazing. So we have lots of different kinds of simulators, and it's not just we have that, the fact that we have those simulators is that we have or we're developing performance models for these new types of vehicles mm -hmm. so we can oh, understand yeah. how they actually fly right. right they don't exist yet so you have to yes. invent the, right. the model of it right yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. it's to take some concept vehicles uh, understand how these vehicles would fly what would their performance be mm -hmm. and then how would they actually fly in, the, in, in an emulated world in our airspace and go through some of those same questions we've all been talking about. Yeah. How do I interact with my controls? Um, do I have a joystick like I would for a helicopter, like a cyclic? Right. Or do I have something else? Right. And what is that mode of interaction? Those are questions that we can also think about for these simulators, yeah. um, along with how do I interface with some new uh, traffic management system specifically for my vehicles, building off the work that Joey's been doing. Yeah. So there's all kinds of different things we can investigate with these simulators. Right, testing everything and how yeah. it comes yeah. together. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and, what I know, does this look like? Yeah, right. That's and so we're cool. going to see what this looks yeah. like in a, in a sense because you brought a video with <laughs> yes. us, with you, right? Let's yeah. see that simulation video and tell us what we're seeing. Sure. There. This is going to be. So, this is a um, video from one of our fixed base flight simulators, so mm -hmm. a flight simulator that does not move. Um, this is one, from one of our researchers, Mike Fury. And um, his simulator here, you can see that it shows a vehicle taking off vertically and now it's moving forward in flight. And what's actually really interesting is some of these vehicles, as they move forward in flight, um, have this transition period because you have to transition from vertical takeoff mm -hmm. to forward flight. Mm -hmm. And helicopters, that kind of occurs instantaneously. 
But for these vehicles, you're going to have this transition period. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting to kind of understand. Mm -hmm. And now you can see the vehicle uh, flying in an urban center. In this case, it's a model of San Francisco. In our simulators, we can model almost any type of urban environment or, um, you know, any landscape that we wish to understand or understand the procedures of yeah. flying. How would I land? Right. How would I come in for my approach? These are some of the things that we can explore. So you can see this vehicle now coming in for its approach and its landing. And this is a, an interesting question. As you come in for your approach and your landing, you can see that vehicle kind of pitch up a little bit. Right, so right. how does that feel? Right. right. So if Joey oh. and I were sitting in the back with our coffees in hand, <laughs> yeah. would, would that coffee spill? Or kind of what, how would Are we going to warm me first? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so understanding that passenger experience mm -hmm. is actually a really big part of some of the work that these simulators can do. So it's not quite this simulator, but we have a, another motion simulator that allows us to understand what is the passion, passenger experience, what yeah. are the forces what does you feel experience. Like? Yeah, what yeah. does it feel like? Right. Yeah. I'm glad to hear That's that. That's so cool. I got sick on a whale watch this year, so I would like you to find out. <laughs> going to get queasy are, are on you an air up? taxi. Are you signing up? For <laughs> I'm going to let you okay. figure it out okay. first for a while. <laughs> then I'll Noted. come sign up for a test. So these simulators, this this for me was one of the coolest things I'd heard about. Do you have a favorite aspect of this research, or what's a really cool thing you want to share? Yeah, so I'd say the number of questions that this research is kind of um, highlighting is really interesting. And the fact that it's this new era of aviation, this new mode of transportation is, is very exciting. So um, as this technology kind of develops and these, these new vehicle configurations come to life and we're starting to explore them, I think the really interesting thing is that this is um, a, a area of work that's going to continue. Mm -hmm. So all mm -hmm. those folks that are interested in understanding or maybe even participating in this area, they have a chance to really be part of it. Oh, yeah. So people yeah. out there have a chance to be part of this new era of transportation. They yeah. can actually be involved, which right. I think is really neat. Right. Yeah. This is by no means finished and settled, yeah. right? We still right. need help. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. What about you, Joey? Uh, what, in, what I'm looking forward to or what I'm yeah, excited about? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, know, about? I, you know, just taking a step back and looking at it from the outside, we are getting a little closer to being uh, Jetsons world, right? <laughs> this is almost like the Jetsons. Age we talked about Jetsons. flying cars before. Yeah. You know, we're still a few steps away from that, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, we're getting there. Right? Yeah. We're going to hopefully have some more operations in the urban environment than we had before. Right. They're going to happen safely. They're going to get us closer to exactly where we want to go. Uh, it's, re it's really neat to see. Yeah. That's totally yeah. cool. Yeah. 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 yeah, I know, right? All right. Well, we've got a <laughs> bunch of questions piling up. We Should do. We take some more? Yeah. Um, so, Vanjali, you were speaking about, like, the passenger, passenger experience and things like that. Uh, Legit Twitch channel has a question. Will people be required to wear parachutes? What kind of safety measures would uh, we expect in oxygen masks, life jackets, things like that. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's a great question, and it raises the fact that as these vehicles are getting certified, mm -hmm. there is that aspect of ensuring um, safe operations, and in the, in the case of off-nominal events, ensuring that those folks on board have the appropriate mechanisms to ensure safety of life, right? right? So right. just like we have um, the safety briefing that we all love to sit in when we, get, when we go fly on yeah. commercial aircraft, yeah. th there has to be um, something most likely similar for, for passenger care vehicles, even if they're urban air mobility vehicles. So safety is the number one concern for mm -hmm. us, for the FAA, and for industry that's developing these vehicles. Makes so there sense. will most likely be something similar. Yeah. We just don't know quite what yet. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Johnny CZ25, <laughs> trying to pronounce these names. <laughs> it's a struggle. <laughs> um, will the will it have aircraft cameras with special software to create a landing point? Um, I know that you have worked on yeah. landing so mechanisms. There, there's, a, there's a lot in that question. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought there's there might be, so. Yeah, so, but it, it's <laughs> a good a one because it, it, it speaks to the number of ways you can accomplish things, right? Um, so, yes, yeah, even if you look at the small drones, they do have cameras of different types that help identify if a landing location is safe to land or not. Mm -hmm. Because you can plan ahead of time, I'm going to land in this open field, right? And I'm going to go there and I'm going to land there and everything's good. But you get there and there's a car there or people are having a picnic, right? Right. Um, do you have a system on board that can help you identify that and then go to an yeah. alternate location? So uh, some visual technology is used to do that. Uh, some of that has been developed at NASA Langley, for example, yeah. uh, to do those sorts of things. Um, and in general, when they're planning their operations, there would be some visualization probably of where they would like to go and how they would like to get there. 
Um, so you could put a point on a screen and then that could be translated into a flight plan and that can be communicated to the system. All these things are things that uh, are, are possible and we've seen examples of already. Yeah, yeah, neat. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you're all over that, <laughs> working on that. Yeah. Um, we have a question here. Um, we begin for you, Joy. Uh, Resonator Game says, if you could snap your fingers and solve one aspect of industrial drone flight, what would it be? Hmm. Good question. Uh, <laughs> just like that. If, if you could snap, I mean, if you can solve the detect and avoid problem for mm-hmm. all vehicles and all classes with a snap of a finger, that that that's would do a, a lot, right? So that that's that's the solve a lot. the last layer of safety, right? How do you make sure that I see that thing that's coming at me and it's very close and mm-hmm. I get out of its way? Mm-hmm. Um, so that means one drone being able to see each, another one coming and if move. Each drone could avoid the things it needs to avoid, mm-hmm. whether they're static things on the ground. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe yesterday there wasn't a crane there and today there is oh, a crane there, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And that's not on my maps. Right. How do I detect that? As well as other things flying in the air, whether it's a traditional Cessna with a real pilot on board that can't see your little drone. Yeah. Um, or maybe doesn't have the same maneuverability as an, an urban air mobility vehicle. Yeah. Uh, how do how do these vehicles uh, detect those problems and then avoid them, right? If you could solve that problem, you, you get a long way towards a lot of the safety questions that uh, need to be answered. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways to do that, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of folks working on that, and there's some very good solutions toward it. Uh, but if it could be universally solved, that would be that would be awesome. Yeah, right. sweet. Um, how about this one from Hovercat? Will the flight controllers and software firmware be open source? That's something to think about. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, for some of these vehicles, you're, they're, the manufacturers that are developing some of these vehicles are uh, have a whole host of configurations, and some of them are working with the traditional flight management computers or flight management systems that you have in commercial aircraft today, and some are some are new. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, depending on the safety cases as well as the secure communication piece that's required, they might not be quite open source, but um, just like we have simulators today that help us understand the performance as well as the controls for those vehicles. I'm sure that something similar will be developed so that folks out there who want to try them out or can want to fly them in, in their own simulator will be able to do so. Mm-hmm. But as, as the industry is developing their tools, they're pulling from um, you know existing tools for, fl- for flight controls today as well as developing their own. So it's kind of a mixed bag right yeah. now. Yeah. Okay, neat. And in general, for the small drones, we're looking at in, in general, everything should be performance based. Can you do? Th- how can you prove you can stay within the bounds of a certain performance envelope? Okay. And I, I, I know I can control my vehicle under all these conditions, and I can show you how I do that. Mm-hmm. Now that may mean you use an open source pieces, or everything's open source, or not. Uh, I can't say that if there was a single open source solution for a piece of that, and it was proven to perform in a certain way, then that would be very valuable. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think it'll be a requirement that everyone uses an open source particular element. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Um, another question here, but you made me think of it. You mentioned the word security. So, legit Twitch channel asks, could drones be subject to hackers? Will there be security measures in place to repel unwanted or harmful signals? Uh, so the answer to the first question is yes, definitely. I mean, any any piece of IT technology, right, mm-hmm. can be Subject potentially hackers. hacked, right, mm-hmm. if it's not built correctly. Um, so the answer is yes. And again, it's part of not necessarily getting to, uh, you want to be as secure as possible at all layers. Okay. But in general, we know that's not likely to happen. Uh, so how do you build enough layers in uh, such that as you layer them all on top of each other, that overall the whole thing stays secure, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of a Swiss mm-hmm. cheese approach. They call it. if you layer the Swiss cheese in certain ways, you cover up all the holes yeah, and you can't see through it. Yeah. yeah right? Okay. So um, <laughs> visual. Yeah. So in terms of cybersecurity, I think that's what you want to look at with these drones, uh, so that even if a given drone was hacked, let's say that right. it can't cause damage to the further system or the mm-hmm. folks on the ground. Does it have other safety mechanisms to make sure that no harm can really come from that? Uh, so there is a yeah. lot of work in cybersecurity related to not just the drones themselves, but the traffic management system as right. a whole. That if that was hacked, that would be bad as well. So, right, so how do you build all these layers in? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think security has to be on the vehicle itself, the communication protocols between the vehicles and their operators. So there's, like Joey was saying, multiple layers of security are yeah. really required. So yeah. anything that's learned from the sphere of drones can be obviously applied to other types of vehicles as well. So it's mm-hmm. a, a question that's, I think, applicable for all, all vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, good. And once, general research-wise, we, we like to consider security a first-class citizen yeah. in the research process, right? It's not yeah. something you tack on at the end. Oh, it's yeah. something you make sure you're thinking about and engaging industry with and the FA with and cybersecurity professionals with as you build up the system. Because you don't want to come up again with a great technological solution that easily hacked and the whole thing falls apart. Right. right? So yeah, you, right. you want to make sure it's robust from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Consider that all along the way. Yep. yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, how third? I don't know. I just bu totally butchered your name. So I'm so sorry. Um, sorry. How do you deal with increased radio traffic? Yeah. So I, 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 there's probably a couple pieces of that. One is like mm -hmm. overuse of a given channel, right? There's just too many people talking on a Stop channel, talking. right? <laughs> and then there's also just kind of a, a, a certain uh, band being overused. For mm -hmm. example, command and control we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we looked at in our flight tests in Reno and Corpus Christi was for these small drones, command and control, uh, different different uh, radio frequencies we use. When do they get saturated? Mm -hmm. When do you have problems with them? Turns out if you, you know, if you fly near an apartment building, there's a lot of people with Wi-Fi routers. And if you're conflicting with that, you may have trouble communicating with your drone. Mm -hmm. These are really known issues, but actually kind of taking a look at it in a real urban environment right. was important. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. Test is yeah. yeah. And I would kind of add to that. Um, you would have, you, you would want to understand what kind of concept would not saturate like a radio frequency too mm -hmm. much. So you want to ensure that any concept that's being developed Joey has mentioned that um, air traffic controllers may not want to be talking to every one of those right. drones, yeah, yeah. every one of those UAM vehicles. Right. So that's part of the concept. So mm -hmm. understanding, hey, how is this actually going to work? That's a really important part of ensuring that we don't saturate certain pieces that we know have limits to them. Mm -hmm. And that includes spectrum as well as frequency. So that's, those go, that goes back to the foundational research. What's right. the concept of operations? Yeah, yeah. a lot of what mm -hmm. you've been saying today is plan for that right. challenge, right. you know, figure out what it is today and, yeah. and plan around it. Right. Yeah. Um, here's a, an urban air mobility question from Legit Twitch Channel again. Could this research eventually lead to people being able to own and operate their own air taxi? Do you think that's coming? Yeah, I think there's going to be lots of different use cases and modes of flying. I think uh, there's going to be cases where some may able, some folks may be able to own their own vehicles. Mm -hmm. Most likely, it'll be a service like we use today. Um, we've seen a big rise in service-based technology, right? So we we'll all yeah. use uh, whether it's vehicles or food delivery services, <laughs> yes. right? So yeah. we've just seen more of that coming along. So most likely, uh, urban air mobility will be accessible as as a surface sur service, mm -hmm. but who knows? Right, mm -hmm. we can all maybe we can all really be the Jetsons. So Joey's <laughs> vision of the future may come to life. We're close. Yeah, yeah. Close. we're close. Yeah. Yeah. We're close. It's, it's funny that you mentioned the Jetsons, and yet, like when I told my mom we were talking about drones on the show today, she said, "Oh, like the Bruce Willis movie, like <laughs> Fifth Element." And I was like, "Yeah, mom, but way safer. <laughs> Check the show out." <laughs> that was a bit of an insane future vision yeah. there. Yeah, this is more way safer. Normal. Not exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question from um, Hovercast. What's your a uh, reasonable tip for a flying taxi driver? <laughs> good, good <laughs> practical information yeah. here yeah. today. That's a great question. So I would say, I go back to like the foundations. What is the national airspace? You got to know your rules of the road. You have to know your procedures. You have mm -hmm. to know your safety and your certification aspects. If you know those, right, you can fly safely and get to where you want to go from point A to point B. But you have to have those foundations. Just to get like a driver's mm -hmm. license before you operate. Right. You've got to have some sort of certification before right. you before you fly. Right. Yeah, right. for sure. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. old joke is what uh, Sea Biscuit in the third. That's my tip. Right? <laughs> so that's what. Yeah. You guys actually understood that question differently <laughs> from before I was taking it. I was gonna say ten percent, fifteen percent, like no. I tip my yeah. hairdresser. Yeah. What's a tip? <laughs> That's a good one. I didn't think about it that way. Right? Either. Because already, but you're right. What would be a reasonable right. tip? In a ride share, interesting. I don't know if should tip. It's awkward. <laughs> but I must say, I want all of uh, all of the advice that you finally gave. I want my driver yes. there to yes. heed to that. <laughs> well read up on all of that, <laughs> right. please. Right? <laughs> all right. Well, let's take a few more. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, we have uh, Joseph Urban here. He says, will cargo air taxis be allowed to fly autonomously before passenger air taxis? So um, maybe Joey and I will tag team this one, but I'll start. <laughs> I think um, as autonomous applications come forth, uh, certification, I go back to that because that's also part of this. How do you certify an uh, autonomous system? Right. So that's a question that we mm -hmm. have. Um, and we're doing research to explore what that means. 
generally, folks do believe you know, car flying cargo may come before flying passengers, right, just mm -hmm. as a natural progression. But um, there are still lots of questions, even if you're a, a cargo autonomous flight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think uh, the cargo stuff is where we'll learn a lot, probably before the passenger mm -hmm. stuff. But that's a somewhat separate question from how autonomous they're allowed to be in the airspace. How do they prove that they can still stay mm -hmm. safe? You know, you have right. the, the benefit of not having people on board, but you still can't have it doing bad things in the airspace or to right. anything on the ground. Right. right. Um, so there's a lot of questions to answer, but yeah. I would guess, yeah, a lot of the things in cargo would happen prior to passenger activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I think it goes back to what you said, Joey. It's a performance-based solution, right? So let's understand the performance of these vehicles, right. and then how do we integrate them into our national airspace? Yeah. And those are still the questions that need to be yeah. resolved. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always the same. Cool. Yeah. Here's a cool idea from Space TV Net. They're asking, will augmented reality be used to display virtual roads in the sky? Could you do that? Yeah, you definitely can. Yeah. We, we sort of have. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen it, and we've done a little bit here as well. Awesome. And the roads, you know, it can be as simple as just, you know, cylinders that you know you have to stay within. Okay. But again, when we're getting to these beyond visual line of sight things, uh, and there's not necessarily a pilot on board for the small drones, uh, obviously it would be hard to carry a pilot. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is more about how much can this be an autonomous operation, right? But visualizing your plan, visualizing the airspace structure, visualizing uh, different aspects of your operation, um, augmented reality could be a, a key part of that. Um, we actually tested some of that in Texas as well. We had folks with the uh, goggles on looking yeah. at the data from the air traffic side as well as the management side of that and interacting with the aircraft in the air in terms of you know zooming in on them and seeing wow. information that's available digitally. Mm -hmm. um, so you could see folks managing in a dense environment maybe uh, just being aware of everything that's going on uh, could have a lot of value. So yeah, a lot of uh, some work is actually going on in that direction already. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That seems yeah. like a perfect use for that kind of technology. Yeah, yeah. it that seems really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question here from Mega Man BXR. Do you think drones will play a bigger part in crime prevention, i.e., monitor the streets overhead in real time, etc.? We already know that a lot of public safety organizations mm -hmm. are looking at using drones more and more. Fire departments. Um, yeah, and if you yeah. think about safety uh, and security, one of the big things we've seen a lot of success on, you can just see it in the news, is you know search and rescue operations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, cities are able to buy these drones that can actually see heat on the ground, so at night they can be flying and see a lost child in a field, right? Um, and and then send folks to that location. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously you can do a lot of good things with drones, right? Uh, one of the other use cases is a fire department wanting to send a drone out ahead of the truck because it can get there faster to survey the scene before the people get there to fight the fire. Mm -hmm. That's another use case that uh, people envision. Again, the airspace has to be ready for that, right? Because right. you, know, yeah. you go back to the, the hot dog drones, you, they, they have to get out <laughs> of the way of that, that fire drone coming through. Right. So yeah, absolutely. Um, without a unified uh, a system to share that information, you, you can't really make that happen cleanly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of interest in, in from police and fire and, and other agencies to, to use these for the things that they already do. I think we already see a lot of emergency response applications. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think with the recent fires here in California, oh. we saw some yeah. of that here as well. Um, I think the, the tools provided a great insight for some of those, for example, firefighters to fight to fight the fires that were were blazing, and then also for um, like volcanic eruptions. There's been u there's okay. been a whole host of other use cases uh, for surveying and providing emergency response. But like Joey was saying, we need the rules of the road there right. and how these aircraft are going to operate or these drones are going to operate to really enable right. them to do their missions. So. Right. Yeah, and we think about you know public safety keeping the public safe, but mm -hmm. these drones can actually keep the first responders safe as well. Right. Right. So right. they can send a drone to the top of a roof to see bad guys or right. whatever it might be or someone that might help mm -hmm. without actually putting people in harm's way first. Right? Yeah. So public safety does go both ways. Uh, so there's a lot of really good uses for this yeah. uh, in, the, in the police and fire realm. Right. And in some cases, like in the testing, I know in Corpus Christi, we had the fire department there with their drone as well, so working closely with oh, the research you? and helping. Exactly. Yeah, yeah we had yeah. the fire department as well. Corpus Christi uh, Police and Fire were great partners awesome. there, uh, organized by the FAA test site in mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they had drones already 
in their inventory. They were already using them for missions. They were were, ready. They were (laughs) participating with us in the flight testing, right? Giving us some feedback on the concept as a whole and us understanding how they already use their drones and make sure that Mm -hmm. the traffic management system and the concept still accommodates what they would like to do. It's really important to get that feedback early and often. Uh, so yeah, we're we're already seeing these agencies do that, and the police were interested in using it, obviously, to identify drones, right? Like mm-hmm. if in the future there's more of these in the air, they want to know that they're supposed to be there, or they're allowed to be there, or they're doing yeah. something good and not bad. So uh, uh, police who have an interest in knowing that the airspace is safe around the public as well. Of course. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a question here that's making me picture the fifth element scenario. Mm. Um, Tyrion <laughs> Dono asks, with drones, you can have many, many small missions starting and ending constantly. So how do you ensure I- efficient use of airspace with an unknown number of vehicles entering the airspace at any time? It sounds like a lot of unknowns it is. and a lot of potential drones. Yeah, and I think you do want to take a, uh, a stepped approach, right, a gradual approach. You know, we don't have to build the system right now to handle... 20,000 operations a minute in a, yes. in a city block, right? Yeah. You don't have to have that system ready today. Yeah. Yep. Um, but how can you start to enable uh, 30, 40, 50 operations over a city at once, right? And then you'll start to see where there are some issues with them sharing the airspace or information so that they can all accomplish what they want to do. And then slowly you can build up those densities. And that's kind of been okay. our approach in the research. Yeah. And we see that approach being adopted as well in industry, right? As they come up with standards around this based on our research to help inform the use of the airspace, um, they're not looking to solve the problem 20 years from now. They want to enable more and more operations today and tomorrow. Right. And it is that scaled approach. Um, so we'll come up with those solutions. We want to make sure that the architecture and the concept will support them in the future. Mm-hmm. Don't box off any solutions. Um, and, and it's, it's going to work. It's, it's going to work. And I would yeah. even yes. up-level that complexity, right? So you can have drones operating below 400 feet. Yeah. And then above that, you could have these electric um, urban air mobility vehicles flying mm-hmm. across uh, urban centers. And then above that, your commercial uh, right. air traffic. Mm-hmm. So how do you have interoperability across all of those layers right. and that same density of operations? And right. that's actually where where the real uh, fun research yeah. questions kind of lie, <laughs> where, where some of our work comes into play. Is mm-hmm. How do you have that air traffic management system to support all of these new entrants and all this uh, density of operations we, we expect in the future? Right. I'd raise you one up level, right? Yeah. We can go 60 thousand feet yeah. plus, right? So oh, really? you have traditional air traffic, and then you have folks that want to fly over 60,000 feet. Maybe Drones? It's with, no, not, no, maybe autonomous vehicles, maybe not, hmm. but how do they share that airspace up there with autonomous vehicles? How do they get yeah. up there first in the first right. place in an efficient way? With such right. a busy... Exactly. So yeah, all these things have to interoperate and, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, work well together. Yeah. Have to level up, Hunter. Yeah. Oh. Uh. I, left, I left space for you. You could have uh, gone, no, gone one more. You could have gone one more. Do you want to take maybe one more question over there? Do you have sure. a, a good um, one to throw out? Well, we have a question um, here. Like, what was the biggest barrier for you personally getting hired? But we always get questions like this, and people want to know, like, how did you get started at NASA? And, mm. you know. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. what's your background? Exactly. Yeah, sure. So, um. I'll, I'll start first, sure. Joey. Yeah. So I'm an aerospace engineer, so that's what I studied in school. That's what I got my, my bachelor's and my master's in. Um, and to be honest, I've always been passionate about uh, aircraft and mm-hmm. flight, and specifically flight controls, and that's how I got started. But I think there's a whole host of opportunities and avenues. Um, I don't think you have to study aerospace engineering, nor, nor necessarily even just aero. So there's, there's a whole uh, different set of fields and discipline that make our research a reality. Right. Yeah. We have people who are uh, psychologists, engineers, um, you know, mm-hmm. analysts, people who work with data. So there's, it, you can really do anything. It's all, I think it's all about the passion. If you're interested in mm-hmm. kind of seeing how we can push the bounds mm-hmm. to bring in all of these new entrants, bring in an, uh, innovation uh, right. into air traffic management, I think there's so many ways you could come in and play a role here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And just to illustrate that with uh, this drone traffic management project that we had, um, we had folks that were aero engineers, very important to understanding the system and how the vehicles work and, and all of those sorts of things. Uh, I'm a computer engineer, so mm-hmm. I, I'm not an aero engineer by training. Um, so that's important in kind of building out the systems. We had a lot of computer scientists, computer engineers helping with this as well. Uh, and then you do get systems engineers and physicists and oh, other yeah. folks that really matter mm-hmm. uh, in doing these human factors people, yep. right, that understand, again, Shivanjali was talking earlier about what do these new control systems look like? How do people interact with them? Mm-hmm. It's a completely new system we're talking about. So right. we don't really know right. how the human needs to interact and with it. how it's it. going to impact the human. Exactly. Yeah, and the what, makes, what makes yeah. their job easier or harder, mm-hmm. right? Um, so all of those kind of folks are really important in building out a system like UTM, and that's what we had on our team. 
Yeah. yeah. It sounds like it, it makes sense, right? Like you've talked about mm -hmm. so many aspects of this work, different facets, different yeah. layers. You kept saying different layers of the, the system. You need so many different perspectives on that. So that's awesome. So that's good yeah. news for people out there. Yeah. yeah. It really does take a team. I think it, you yeah. have a team with a whole wide range of disciplines that really allows some of this technology to come to light. So right. Sounds like yeah. it. It's yeah. a great place to solve hard problems. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. That's what aeronautics really offers. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think what it brings a lot of people. That's what brought me in. Uh -huh. right? uh, to, it's a good place to solve really hard problems that make an impact. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. It thank has. you guys for joining yeah. us thank today. You. We Thanks. have just about run out of time, but yeah. thank you for being here. <laughs> and thank you to everybody who joined us in the chat on Twitch. We'll be back in the new year. So follow NASA on social media to hear about upcoming shows. And to see past episodes of this show, you can check out nasa.gov slash Ames slash NASA in Silicon Valley Live. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.